All right, we're ready to go. There's a lot of rules. I can see why people get confused. There's clicker problems, and you have this box you have to stand in. Anyway, and you gotta wait. Um, so anyway, I'm Chris Schwartz. This is a co-author work with uh, Brad Barber and Ching, who I think is here somewhere, uh, Philippe and, and Terry. Uh, and so I'm uh, happy for the program uh, committee to include this paper. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to Chester's uh, discussion. And as I did before uh, I started, I, I thanked him. This is the third time he's had to sit through a presentation of this paper. Um, so hopefully it's not getting too stale yet. Uh, so obviously this is a session about transaction costs. Right? And so let's start thinking about transaction costs for trading. And so you can think to Jones 2002, made this estimate of transactions costs from uh, 1975 to 2000. Uh, and you can see, of course, the transactions cost for trading equities has gone down considerably. All right? And the reason it's gone down is because in 1975, we had May Day, which got rid of uh, the commission, fixed commissions, and we had competition for commissions. Um, and if you're uh, senior enough, like me, I actually traded stock in the 1980s on my parents' account, and you get to pay $60, 70 $80 uh, for commissions on a 100, 100 share trade, right? So is it really expensive? I know, I was an eight-year-old and got to trade uh, stock. So anyway, it was an interesting life I had. Um, and so, of course, after this, you know, in 2015, we had Robinhood announce commission-free trading. Uh, in 2019, uh, we had everybody basically go commission-free, so Schwab went first and then every single broker basically followed after them, right? And so we entered this world where we have commission-free trading. And so a lot of people have confused commission-free and free, right? And so the SEC brought this up in their GameStop report, which basically says, hey, look, don't be confused about no commissions and free. Those two things are not the same thing, and you should worry about the order execution that you have, all right? And so the question is, is you know, what has happened to execution costs after we have gone commission-free? All right, and that's what this paper is gonna, gonna be about. All right, and so if you think about the structure of the industry, we as retail investors, and I'm assuming pretty much almost everyone in here is a retail investor, you can open a trading account at TD Ameritrade, E-Trade, Fidelity, Robinhood, um, e I mentioned E-Trade, IBKR, uh, Webull, TradeStation, whoever you want. And historically, when you placed a trade, it would've got routed to an exchange, right? So you would've placed your order, you know, eventually it would have hit that phone that was on the exchange way back in the day. Someone picked up the phone, they would have written out a piece of paper, went over to the specialist if you trade in NYC stock, and someone would have bought it, right? And that's how our trades were executed. But now, I can promise you that if you traded any of these brokers here, except for potentially interactive, your trade will never be initially routed to the exchange. With 100% probability, I can tell you that your trade will never be routed to an exchange. It will be routed to some kind of dark pool, right? And the most common dark pool that your trades will be routed to is one of the six market centers that we have here in the US. So we have Virtue, we have Citadel, we have G1X, we have Two Sigma, uh, we have Jane Street, and we have UBS. Oh, I forgot UBS there, because they're the worst executor, but that's a different issue, all right? If you trade with Interactive, you don't necessarily go to one of these wholesalers. They have their own ATS, which is essentially have their own internal exchange where they'll trade your stock, right? But they're not going to the exchange. And so why aren't they going to the exchange? Well, the reason number one is the brokers don't want to route your trade to the exchange if you make a market trade. If you make a market trade and it goes to an exchange and you take liquidity from the exchange, they will charge the broker 0.3 cents per share, right? Which doesn't sound like that a lot, but it's a lot, right? And so they don't want to do that. So the brokers are more than happy to route to the wholesalers because they save this fee, all right? And the wholesalers are more than happy to take this because they make a boatload of money off of retail trading. All right, so if you think back to Kyle 1985, you know, we have all the traders go on exchange, right? And so if you really think about it, you have uninformed investors are subsidizing informed investors, right? The spread is smaller for informed investors than it should be. And so what happens is we've had this segregation of order flow where most institutional trade is still on exchange and most retail trade has gone off exchange and now spreads on exchanges have widened, right? And so those wide spreads are the benchmark for which wholesalers have to execute retail trades. So that's called the NBBO, the National Best Bid, National Best Offer. That's what they have to meet or beat for your trade. But you can imagine the spread for retail traders is much smaller, right? And essentially the difference between those two spreads, you know, the institutional trade and the dark pool spread for retail trade is how the wholesalers make their money. Now there's three people that split in the profit. So obviously we know Citadel makes money, thank you to the tax leak about the Citadel president, right? Citadel owner only made like $1.7 billion per year for five years in a row, all right? So know that the wholesaler is gonna take some money. The second uh, bit of money is called payment for order flow and that gets kicked back to the brokers, 
And then the third people that make money is the retail traders. Right? So they actually get something called price improvement, which is when your trade trades better than the NBBO. All right? And so immediately when you see this, you can see where the conflict is going to come from, which is the wholesalers are definitely taking their profit, so that part of the pie is set aside. And then the rest of the profit is going split, to get split between the broker and the customer. Right? And the more money the broker wants to make, in theory, the worst execution the customer can get. Right? If the broker takes 100% of the additional profit as PFOP, that means there's zero price improvement left for the trader. And if the broker takes zero cents of PFOP, that means the trader, in theory, gets all the price improvement. Right? So this is an inherent conflict of interest that people talk about when they talk about PFOP. Right? And if you talk to different people in the industry, of course, there's varying opinions. Right? So probably one person's opinion that's very important is this person, who is Gary Gensler, who is the SEC chair, who says that payment for order flow is a serious issue and has serious conflicts of interest. In fact, for a long time, he wanted to ban payment for order flow. And I would argue that the auction rule the SEC has proposed is a backdoor way of basically banning most payment for order flow. Right? Then you have people like Citadel in 2004 who actually said payment for order flow is a serious conflict of interest and should be banned. It's amazing what 19 years can do, isn't it? Right? You go from, hey, let's, it's a terrible thing that we love it, let's keep it. On the other side of the debate, you have people that say, look, this issue has been grossly exaggerated. Right? The problem is the people on the other side of the debate are not exactly the people you go to if you want to get the truth about something, because this quote's by Bernie Madoff, all right, who is not, again, a great person to talk about, but of course he was one of the first people to create off-exchange trading. Right? So everything you want to say about Bernie, a lot of the market structure we have today was actually innovated by him. All right? If you look at the literature we have, essentially the literature says, and this is that PFOP will create wider spreads, aka PFOP is expensive to people. Right? PFOP is bad. Right? That's the summary of the literature. You can also see the literature is not very long, and the literature is from a long time ago, so 2003 and 1997. So there's not a lot of literature about impact of payment for order flow on pricing and execution. All right? <clears throat> so overriding all of this is we have this one corner here, this side of the box, where you have payment for order flow as a serious conflict of interest, and then you have the other side of the box, which is we have all these rules that talk about best execution. Right? So when you place a trade at a broker, they have a duty to provide you best execution. Right? So you can see I have two different SEC things here. Duty of best execution requires a broker-dealer to seek the most favorable terms reasonable and available. But from FINRA, the resultant price to the customer is favorable as possible. Right? In fact, the chief economist of FINRA told me it would be a violation of best X if you took more payment order flow and provided worse execution. Right? So on the other corner, you have the regulations that say, hey, PFOP better not matter, or you're basically violating the rules of the SEC and FINRA, right? And so ultimately, the question we have in this paper is, to start with, is whether or not PFOP matters. Whether, actually, stop for that. Whether or not price execution is different between brokers, right? And so obviously, you can see the yes is payment for order flow matters. There's this conflict of interest. You get worse pricing. On the other side is, of course, best execution says you're always going to get the same price. Now, there's one small technical issue with you being able to evaluate this, which is data, right? So if you go to all the brokers at the same time and you punch in a quote, uh, you know, you punch in, you know, BBBY, just for example, all of them will tell you the same quote, the same bid, and the same ask, right? They'll, every single one will have the same, it'll be NBBO. But you'll have no idea what execution price you get unless you actually trade, right? Because we know most of the time you get price improvement, it doesn't tell you what kind of price improvement you get. If you go to our standardized databases, you have no idea who the broker is, and their trades are usually not signed. Right? So, of course, the biggest one you use is TAC. Right? So TAC will tell you if it's exchange D. That means it's off exchange, so you know it's probably not, uh, it might be retail trade. There's, of course, the BJZZ uh, algorithm tries to identify retail trades and sign them, but even that can't tell you what broker they came from. All right? So we did something incredibly innovative in this paper, which is we decided to lose a shitload of money. That was our innovation in this paper. And the way we did it was we opened six brokerage accounts at five different brokers, and we traded. Real money. We placed 85,000 trades worth $16 million over five and a half months. And we're going to use that data to evaluate whether or not brokers are giving the same prices and the other questions that we're going to talk, ask about. So first question of principal importance is, do you get the same execution? And the answer is it's not even close. Right? So uh, I started working on this with a computer science student back in October. We got uh, Robinhood, uh, their API working, so most of our work here is over API. 
Uh, and then finally, on December 21st, I had uh, Robinhood and TD trade at the same time. So same stock, same time, same amount. So at the end of the day, I logged into my Robinhood account. And you can see on the first day of trading, I lost $150.43 of my Robinhood account. So I logged into my TD account. I made $12.61. Same stocks, same time, same amount. Oh, and by the way, if you're worried about latency, on this particular day, this is before we randomized order, which I'll talk about later, Robinhood got to go first. All right, so Robinhood actually went first on every single one of these trades, and yet they still got destroyed by TD. All right, and I remember calling my RA and telling you know, my RA, I mean, I told you same amount, same time, and she's like, that's what I did. And when you got the trade report, it was there. All right, so we're gonna talk more about price differences later, but just you know, in summary, I can tell you there's gonna be big price differences and they're going to be persistent, and they're going to be statistically large, and they're going to be economically large. Right? And then the question, and by the way, these are market orders, just to be clear. These are market orders. Right? And so the question is, what's the explanation? Right? So first of all, is it payment forward or flow? Is it PFOP? And we don't find any evidence that PFOP is related to our execution. Right? Now, could it be that PFOP matters at some marginal level that we can't detect because we don't have enough trades? I'll concede that but I'm pretty confident that we can say that PFOP does not matter at any economical level, right, in terms of driving the execution differences. All right, can routing disclosures, so 605 disclosures, which I'll talk about later, and 606, could A, predict that this is gonna happen? In other words, if you look at current public disclosure, could you predict that we're gonna get radically different prices across brokers? And the answer to that is definitely no. And so the last explanation is very simple, which is we find that wholesalers are systematically discriminating against brokers. So if the same trade at the same time goes to the same wholesaler, they will give radically different prices to each trade, right, systematically, right? And so we'll show that in our results here. All right, and of course the question is then why does that happen? Right, if it's not related to PFOB, why do we see this? All right, so the first thing is gonna be quality of order flow. That's the explanation we've given. I can talk a little bit about that. Size of the order flow, all right? Stability of the order flow, and then different brokers might have different objective functions. Right? And so I'll talk a little bit about those and add some color based on conversations we've had with the industry as well as some other trading that we've done afterwards uh, since this. So we're still trading, uh, even today. All right, so let's talk a little bit about our trading experiment. All right, so what we're gonna do here is we open six brokerage accounts at five different brokers. And they didn't all start and end at the same time, so this is kind of the time series of what we did. Um, so you can see here we started with TD and Robinhood, then added Interactive Broker, then E-Trade, Fidelity, and uh, IBKR Lite at the end. So you can see here we have six accounts, two uh, IBKR accounts, even though they don't necessarily all overlap except for the, you know, over the exact same period of time. If you only look at the trades that overlap, you're going to get exactly the same results that I show you here. Right? The price differences we're talking about are incredibly persistent. Uh, just to give you an idea, I was trying to estimate before I came down here, we probably traded TD and Robinhood at the same time for over 260 trading days times six hours, that's 1,560 minutes, uh, 60 hours. Robinhood has never won one of those hours in execution quality, not one of 1,560. So what I'm gonna show you here is incredibly persistent over time, all right? All right, so why are these particularly important? Why did we pick these? All right, so number one is, is that these are the largest brokers that you have. The only one missing here is Schwab. Uh, we did not trade Schwab for two reasons. Uh, so one is Schwab, of course, bought TD Ameritrade. And so you might have a reasonable assumption that Schwab and TD Ameritrade would have the same assumption. By the way, that's a terrible assumption, as we found it, because we, tr we traded Schwab since. And the second one is that Schwab, we have to hand trade. Right, so Schwab doesn't have ac give access to their API to retail customers, so we had to actually pay someone to sit there and time their trades at the same time as the API. All right. um, the other reason that these are great is because there's a huge variation in payment for order flow. All right, so you can see here, uh, only one of our broker charges commissions, which is the Interactive Bro Broker Pro account, um, and then you can see the other ones uh, you know, have uh, no commissions, but different levels of PFOP. So you can see TD Ameritrade gets about 0.1 cents of PFOP per share, uh, Robinhood, if you weighted average based on their 606, is 0.22 cents per share. Uh, E-Trade is 0.18 cents per share. Uh, Fidelity gets no payment for order flow, nor does the uh, Interactive Pro account. They don't get any payment for order flow either. So we have a big cross-sectional variation in payment for order flow, so we can look at the execution differences and then look at what payment for order flow looks like. All right. One thing I would want to note here is, um, is the payment for order flow to every wholesaler is the same. So TD gives 0.1 cents to every single wholesaler, right? So I think there's this confusion because of payment for order flow, like TD wants to send orders to Citadel instead of Virtue or G1X or somebody else. That's not true. They have the same incentive in terms of price. 
to send their order to everybody. All right, so just a little clarification. All right, what stocks do we trade? <clears throat> so we created a, a stratified sample from CRISP using uh, you know, number 10 and number 11 stocks. So you can think of these as your standard US companies listed uh, on the exchanges here. Uh, so we basically created bins by price, market cap, volatility, liquidity, and randomly picked one of the stocks out of the bins to trade. So that's 128 stocks. We added what I'll call 10 non-randomly selected special stocks. So six of them are mega cap stocks. You can see like Apple and Google, the ones that trade the most every day, as well as for retail drawings like AMC. Uh, and then every day, uh, based on some prior literature, that uh, research that we have that shows that the top four movers on Rob Robinhood every day have a disproportionate amount of retail trading, we added the top four movers every day on Robinhood that were over a dollar, right? So those are our criteria, All right? So basically every day at every broker, we traded almost 145 stocks a day over the course of our period here. All right, how do we trade? All right, so what we do is, is we basically randomize sync and sync. So one of the sync or sync, uh, sync with sync, sync with sync, there we go, order. There we go. When you had tongue-tied, just use a different word. All right, uh, so we're gonna randomize order. So one of the biggest issues, of course, you need things to be at the same time, uh, but time, when you talk about trading, is very continuous. All right, just to give you an idea, we had some issues with NBBO. I called the New York Stock Exchange and Citadel, and they wouldn't have the same NBBO because Citadel's offices were 50 miles outside of New York, and the speed of light was not fast enough to get the update of the NBBO to Citadel before they placed the trade. So that's what kind of, when we say same time, a wholesaler will tell you same time as in microseconds, which there's no way we're going to hit. Right, so what we did was we randomized sequency. So every time there was a trade, it was randomly generated which broker went first, second, third, fourth, et cetera. Right, so no broker has an advantage over another broker. We even looked at make sure like the API latencies are not the same. It doesn't matter, pretty much everyone trades in random order. So unless you can kind of with a story where execution quality is somehow randomly related to our program, uh, we have latency pretty well done. And I'm actually gonna show you that, uh, that the latency, the order we go in really doesn't matter. We start trading at 940 every day to kind of avoid the opening auction and, and end at 350 every day. <clears throat> we evenly space our trades out over time, right? So about every three minutes we'd place a trade, right? When we buy, we'd then sell 30 minutes later. Why do we wait 30 minutes? Well, we want to see if market conditions maybe change within the 30 minutes. We just don't want to do immediately buy and sell. Uh, just let the market change a little bit. But of course, we don't really want to capture market movements here when we look at, say, round trip trading costs. <clears throat> All right, uh, let's see what else do we have here. And then, uh, so one thing about the paper is, when we started off trading, we were doing $100 trades and $1,000 trades in parallel. So every time we trade one of our stocks, one of our 145 stocks, we basically played a $100 trade and a $1,000 trade randomized. And then after the month of January, we went and looked and saw that our $100 trades and our $1,000 trades got exactly the same execution, and I'll show you that coming up. All right, and so of course, we didn't want to lose any more money than possible, um, so we stuck with the $100 trades. We also did an experiment in March where we did $5,000 trades, and the $5,000 trades and the $100 trades also got the same execution. So I'm pretty confident that the results that we'd have here would probably generalize up to, say, any four-digit dollar trade, um, but of course, anything over that, you know, there's some ambiguity there. One th important thing to note here is we did not do fractional trading. So even when we were trading Google and it was $3,300 a share, we would do one share of Google. Uh, if you don't know, fractional shares are, are treated differently than whole shares, so they're called non-held, right? So non-held shares don't really have rules about price execution. So for example, one broker, not one that we use, will actually take all of their fractional trades over the day and then execute them at the end of the day. So literally, they'll sit on the trade for hours before they execute their fractional trade, all right? All right, so let's talk a little bit about what we see. All right, so just uh, get some basics out of the way here. I know probably most of us, uh, I know all of us have been day trading. All of you are trading BBY, right? BBY, that's, uh, that's what you guys do. So, but just to make sure we're on the same page here, regulators expect you to trade at NBBO or better, all right? And so again, you can see here, if I use my little laser pointer, this is from TD and Robinhood, and uh, no matter where you are in the room, you can't read this, but like I said, they have the same quotes. Uh, and for this particular quote, this is for Netflix, and you can see that essentially there's a 10 cent spread, right? So the bid is 80, the offer is 90, so if you buy here, you pay the 80, and if you sell here, you pay the, uh, the you, sorry, if you buy here, you get the 90, if you sell here, you get the 80, all right? So that's pretty much how NBBO works, all right? So what happens is, is of course, you get price improvement, 
right? So this is really the trick here for how price improvement comes from. And so if you're thinking on the buy side, you know, if you buy a 258.89, so I'm just gonna use the cents here just to make it easy, you get one cent of price improvement or 10% of the spread. If you get three cents less that you pay, you get 30% spread price improvement. And if you trade at the midpoint, of course, you get five cents in dollar amount or 50% 50, 50 of the spread. By the way, 50% is basically the best trading economically you can think about, right? It's free trading. If you have no commissions and always execute at the midpoint, you're basically trading for free, right? And then there's no expectations that you could ever trade faster than that, thank you. Right, and of course, so that's from the, the, if you're buying, and if you're selling, of course, it's just the opposite way, so one cent better, two, three cents better, five cents better, it's the same idea when it comes to the sell side. All right, so we're gonna measure uh, price and uh, our, our execution quality three ways. Now, I'm gonna really focus more on the one on the top right here as I go along, but you can measure it in dollar amount, uh, which you can do here because we're trading the same stock at the same broker at the same time. So we don't have to worry about order flow differences. Right? So if you're talking about individual brokers, the order flow at Robinhood is probably very different than the order flow at Interactive Broker, and so the dollar amounts are gonna look different. But here, it's just because we're having the same stocks, it's, it's equivalent. The other one is you can look at the percent of spread. And I'm gonna focus mostly on that because almost all of our stocks at the same broker will end up getting, on average, the same execution in terms of percent of spread. So it seems like the wholesalers try to target some kind of percent of NBBO. They have like a switch they use, and they, they basically give that to every trade. Uh, and then the other way you could do it is round trip trading costs. So how do we get that? So of course we have our buy and sell here, all right? So this is our, our actual return on the trade. Our trade does have some market movement in it. During our sample period, the market tended to go down. Um, but you can uh, subtract off what the return would have been if you traded all your trades at MBBO and whatever is left over would be your execution cost, right? So this is market movement. This would be our total cost and the difference here is gonna be execution costs. All right, so what we got here? All right, so this is uh, your midpoint benchmark. Right, so this is the best possible trading that you can do. Uh, NBBO is the worst possible trading you can do, and you can see everybody's in the middle, which is great, because uh, they gotta be inside NBBO. But most importantly, you can see the execution differences between our traders, our brokers are huge. So on average at TD, you get 47% price improvement of the spread. You basically trade at the midpoint. So 70% of our TD trades were at the midpoint or better. Right, if you go down to Interactive Broker, Whichever account you use, we only got about 20% of NBBO, right? So these differences that we saw are economically uh, huge. All right, again, if you look at dollar amounts, you can see it's the same thing. So again, kind of equivalent because we're trading the same things. Now, please note, we're, we're trading a stratified sample of a lot of small stocks. So our, our trading, uh, round trip trade costs here are, are large because we're trading a lot of small stocks. But you can see there's clearly a huge difference between the execution quality that we're getting against brokers. All right, and so thank God I didn't have the Interactive Broker account. That's all I have to say. Poor Philippe. Philippe complains every day about Interactive Broker. <laughs> and I still make him trade it every day. It's great. All right, so you can see here there's huge economic differences. All right, the other thing just to note here, and they put duct tape on the back button, uh, is if you look at the first column, that's percentage of your trades that are actually executed off exchange. So these are the trades executed. And you can see, except for Interactive Broker uh, Pro account, you can see that 95 plus percent of your trades are executed off exchange. If you actually look at routing, which we'll get to in a minute, 100% of your trades are, ex are, are routed off exchange. So some, some trades do end up on exchange from the wholesalers. All right, so just a couple of things for robustness. So again, um, this is back in, in uh, January when we were trading uh, $1,000 and $100 at the same time. So in the first column you see $100, second column you see $1,000. Um, and you can see there's really no execution difference if we use $1,000, $100, which is why we stopped trading 1000 uh, and if you think about uh, the timing of the trades, the order, so on the bottom here I have the second trade, third trade, or fourth trade in the order of trades that we place. Um, you can see the magnitude of the broker differences at the top. You can see the magnitude of the time differences in terms of the order that we execute in the bottom. And A, not only they're not st statistically significant, but you can see they're zero, right? So again, the order in which we trade, kind of the latency issue is really not an issue for us. Uh, again, we're not trading big amounts here, so that's probably not all that surprising, all right? Uh, for the sake of time here, I'm gonna skip these graphs and we'll get right down to the end here, which is interpretation of our results. So let's talk about PFOB. All right, so again, the first reason that we're gonna look at in terms of reasons for what we find is gonna be PFOB. All right, so, and again, this is the one that people are interested in. So if you look very quickly here, right, if you just glance up quickly, you probably only see three dots. You see TD, E-Trade, and Robinhood, and uh, if you just draw a line here, it looks like, hey, that looks like there's a pretty good relation there between payment for order flow and execution quality. 
except there's two small technical problems, and that's the two over here on the y-axis, which is our two brokers that have no payment for order flow are way over here, right? In fact, Fidelity is the second best broker even though they have no payment for order flow, right? So if you just start thinking about the order of these trades, uh, the order of the brokers, it probably starts not to make a lot of sense that PFOP could explain a lot when Interactive Broker Pro has the worst execution, and I, I didn't note this, but I should, but our results I'm giving you for Interactive Pro are before the commissions. So these are just the execution costs, not the commission costs. And now you can see why Philippe really hates me. All right, so that was before the commissions that he had to pay. All right, we also, as I mentioned, we've done Schwab afterwards, thank you. If you put Schwab in our little matrix here, you can see Schwab would re be right there in the middle, which kind of ruins that straight line anyway if you're looking for payment for order flow. And if you think about kind of drawing a rough line here, you can see it's pretty flat, right? So again, payment for order flow, maybe a different, it's, it matters, right? We have the biggest brokers, there's a lot of other brokers we don't have, um, but again, economically, I don't think it can explain very much of what we find in our, in our results, all right? So it doesn't really appear to be payment for order flow. All right, broker routing differences, I'm not gonna show you um, a lot of results on this, but basically each broker files something called a 606. The 606 report tells you where your trades get, what percentage of trades get routed to each market center, what kind of payment for order flow they get, all right? And then you have something called form 605. So each of those market centers then file a form that tells you what kind of price improvement they gave on each stock. Right, so for example, uh, TD uh, will route 47% of their trades to Virtue. Virtue will give a 605 that says on every single one of their, every single stock, on average what price improvement they give. And so for our trades, you can actually calculate our expected price improvement based on the routing information that the broker gives and then the execution quality of the market center. Um, those explain almost zero difference in what we find. Right, so if you look at the, the data that you have publicly disclosed by SEC regulations, you'd imagine that every single broker would give you the same execution. All right, and before we started this paper, I really didn't think it mattered if you opened an account at Fidelity or E-Trade or TD, right? They all sound the same to me, um, and so I'm sure that's probably one of the reasons why. All right, and the last thing I'm gonna talk about, and, and this is really the thing that drives, is market centers, all right? So it's market centers. And just to show you data on this, how we get data is if you have a brokerage account, you can request your 606B1 routing data, and they will have to tell you where every single one of your trades was routed. So for every one of our trades, our 85,000 trades, we know exactly which wholesaler received the trade. And so we can match trades and see, okay, when we had trades go to the same wholesaler, what kind of execution do we get? Um, IBKR never gave us our data, um, ever. Like Taylor Swift, like ever, 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 never. Um, <laughs> and we've requested it like 12 times. So I even called, I have a call with the chair at the end of December and told him we didn't get our data, so maybe we'll get our data soon. Anyway, so you can see here that these are same orders, so a TD order, a Robinhood order going to the same wholesaler at the same time. Price improvement for TD is 48%, price improvement for Robinhood is 25%. Same thing here for E-Trade, 47, 37. If you look at any, if you look at Fidelity, it's the same thing. All right, if you look at uh, the different wholesale, and again, you can see if you use the different market centers, it's the same. I'm just going fast here because I'm a little short of time. It's not one wholesaler that's kind of doing the difference. It's all the wholesalers that are giving the difference. So this isn't a wholesaler specific story. You can see all the wholesalers are giving TD better execution at the, both of the comparisons that we have here. All right, so the last thing I'll just do here really quickly in the last amount of time I have. Uh, so why do we see these differences if it doesn't seem to be related to PFOP? And the big answer that we get from everybody is this, the quality of the order flow. Right? And a lot of people might think here we're talking about, well, is it informed or not informed? And maybe that's the story for IB, but a lot of the story is, it's just we can't cross trades, right? So if you think about Robinhood, everyone at Robinhood probably buys the same stuff at the same time. So you send those orders to Citadel and Citadel has no way to cross them with somebody else, right? And that's how they make the most money, right? If I place a trade for shares of BBBY on the buy, and one of you place a trade for BBBY on the sell, and they go to Citadel, Citadel's happy, right? They can cross at the midpoint, give everybody a little price improvement, they take no inventory risk, they got no capital risk. But if all of us in the room are buying the same stock at the same time, and it all hits Citadel, well, Citadel has no way to hedge their inventory risk, right? And their only choice is whether they have to sit on it and take the risk, or they have to exhaust it to the exchange, which of course, remember, cost them 0.3 cents per share. Right? And so that's the biggest explanation. Uh, and we've done some work on this afterwards, and, and if you look at our, our trades just as pockets, you can see where market toxicity is high, where there's big inventory costs, you can actually see our execution's pretty bad. Size of order flow, so TD by far is the biggest broker. Right? So they do about five million darts versus 14 million darts for the top six brokers. So maybe that's one reason. 
Uh, stability for order flow. So we have all sorts of fun routing data. So one of the interesting things is TD doesn't do smart routing, right? So they just take a chunk of their order flow and just throw it off to each wholesaler. Uh, Robinhood actually does smart routing. So they look at which market center had the best execution on each stock the last 30 days, and they'll try to route it to the market center that does the best. It doesn't matter uh, which one you do, people pretty much end up at the same place. <laughs> Uh, and then differing objective functions. So uh, one of the things that we only did market trades in this one, um, one of the most interesting things is that Robinhood has amazing execution on fractional trades. So you basically almost get midpoint pricing on fractional trades uh, from Robinhood. And if you place a marketable limit order at TD, you get 8% price improvement, right? Even though every other broker will give you 33% price improvement on marketable limit, even though TD has 47% market price improvement on marketable uh, market uh, orders. So there might be some differing objective functions that brokers uh, trade. All right, so uh, there's huge execution differences. Uh, we don't really think these things are, are highly related to PFOP. Uh, it does seem that the, it's driven by the fact that market centers systematically discriminate against brokers. <clears throat> uh, possible explanations I just went through, so I won't re repeat the list. And our basic uh, uh, policy implication was that we should have uh, basically market center execution broker by broker. So Citadel should say what kind of execution they give to each one of their brokers individually instead of just giving a 605 that has order execution in aggregate. Thank you. <laughs>